Guys, you're never gonna believe what happened to me this week. Let me guess. You finally found a girl whose family doesn't expect a dowry. Or one who's both beautiful and blind. <laughs> Remember last week how I said I want to have greater faith? Well, I finally did it. Did what? I deleted all my Facebook accounts except one. Now, when I give a girl my password to show her I'm not flirting with other girls, it's the honest truth. Allah have mercy. You also invited Bilal to join us this week. So, that's a step of faith. Yeah, Hamza told me you're reading stories from the Injil. Who knew Hamza could read? Love the new hairstyle, by the way. Cracking man bun, mate. Hamza changes hairstyles as often as a princess changes her jewellery. <laughs> <laughs> Every princess needs a prince like Hamza. Abdullah, you said you were going to read the story this week of how the Messiah destroys evil at its source. Guys, you know what? When I think about these stories, I feel like there's this new world I'm discovering, but also this fear of what would happen to me if I died today. Only Allah knows. Bilal, I'm so happy you're here. Let's see, uh, can someone give a summary of what we've seen so far? We started talking about how complete forgiveness is costly, and made even more difficult when it involves God's honour. We talked about how the story of God has a perfect beginning, a tragic corruption, God's plan of redemption and forgiveness, and a perfect ending. And about how God's plan of forgiveness began with God teaching his people of old to offer sacrifices to honour God and receive forgiveness. Right, and then we saw how the Messiah was born miraculously through the Virgin Mary, and God's promise to Adam and Eve and the prophets about how the Messiah would come and be destroyed, but also somehow destroy evil at its source, and then somehow reign forever as a king who restores God's blessing to the world. The last few weeks, we've seen the Messiah's miraculous power over nature and over death itself. Jesus even claimed the authority to forgive sins. Again, I ask, how can this be? The best place to find answers to those big questions is to go straight to the source. Let's start with Mark's Gospel, chapter 14. And he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Thanks for the reading, Hamza. Let's retell the story together. It starts with the religious leaders coming together to discuss arresting Jesus and killing him without anyone knowing. The people loved Jesus and people followed him everywhere, but the religious leaders were very jealous of him gaining followers and attention. One of Jesus' followers named Judas goes to the religious leaders and agrees to betray him. And later that night, we see Jesus with his disciples in a garden. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow, even to the point of death. My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. By this point, Judas has gone and told the religious leaders where Jesus was, and they brought soldiers with swords and clubs to arrest him. Every day I sat in the temple courts teaching, and you did not arrest me. But let the scriptures be fulfilled. Let the scriptures be fulfilled. He must be talking about all the prophecies about the Messiah. They bring Jesus before the most important religious leaders and they bring accusations against him. He doesn't deserve he to doesn't live. He doesn't deserve to live. He claims God is his father. But Jesus just remains quiet. He doesn't even try to stop what's happening to him. Until. Are you the Christ? The Son of the Blessed? I am. <gasps> and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. What further witnesses do we need? You've heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? He deserves to die. Away with him. Crucify him. Tell us your decision. Then they bring Jesus before the Roman leader, since the Romans were the occupying power. He must die! He's leading people astray! Have you no answer to make? Again, Jesus makes no response, and the Roman leader is simply amazed. Crucify, Crucify him! Crucify him! him. Crucify, Crucify, him. Crucify, him. Crucify him! Who's following you now? Crucify him. <laughs> Where is your God? Again. Where is your God? Hit him again! The king! King of the Jews. <laughs> and then they crucified him.
and they continue to mock him. He saved, saved others. others. He cannot, he cannot save, save himself. himself. <laughs> Let the Christ, the King, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Come on then! <laughs> Darkness came over the land for three hours as Jesus hung on the cross. My God. My God. Why have you forsaken me? It is finished. One of Jesus' followers took his body and laid him in a tomb that had been cut in a rock. What does it all mean? This is a pretty depressing story. It's a detailed account, but isn't it different from the Quran? Let's start by asking some questions. Uh, what do you see Jesus doing in the story? The whole time, Jesus knows exactly what's happening, as if it's all been written. He even prays in the garden and asks God if it's possible for a different way. But it seems like he knows there isn't. Yeah, in front of the religious leaders and then in front of the Romans. He doesn't do anything to try and save himself, just the opposite. He says the prophecies are coming true in all that's happening to him. And then it just gets horrible. The beating, the mocking, the crucifixion. I don't understand why this is happening. I can't understand why God would allow this to happen to a prophet. Complete forgiveness is very costly. And the prophets offered sacrifice to honor God and get forgiveness. Is, is there a connection? Uh, good point, Mamun. Uh, what do you guys think? And what of the Quranic verses? I went back last week and read all the verses in the Quran about Jesus. It only briefly mentions this story, and the meaning wasn't entirely clear. Then Allah said to Isa, I will take you and raise you to myself. Isn't the meaning of this verse that God allowed Jesus to die? In the end, the only clear thing in the Quran is the Jews didn't kill him, and that's what we just read here. The Romans did. Where the detailed account we just read, it seems God must intend us to get the full meaning of the crucifixion from the Injil. There's a connection between forgiveness and sacrifice. I'm trying to put it all together. So our sin is like your relative's karma. It totally destroys everything. Like what happened with Adam and Eve in the garden. And Adam and Eve couldn't restore themselves to God. God himself first covered Adam and Eve with the skins of an animal. And then from here, he gave the people the law of animal sacrifice. The animal got the consequence of death and the people got forgiveness. How does an animal have the value to take the consequence of a person's sin? But what if the animal didn't actually take the consequence? What if God was preparing the people for complete forgiveness through a complete sacrifice? This is one of Hamza's moments. Uh, go on. Yeah, 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 yeah. So when Jesus cries out on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He is suffering the full consequence our sin requires. It's costly forgiveness, but a complete sacrifice. And God's honor is fully restored. Instead of destroying us because of our sin, God destroyed the sins of the world through the sacrifice of the Messiah. And this is the fulfillment of God's promise to Adam and Eve. But what about the other promise to the prophets? That the Messiah will live as king forever? Ali, Jesus' followers wondered the same thing. You guys talk about this a lot. I have some friends who would really like to hear this. <laughs>